If you're loving this podcast, be sure to check out our full lineup. From news and local politics to sports and true crime, find your next great listen right now at DuluthNewsTribune.com slash podcasts. That's DuluthNewsTribune.com slash podcasts. Hello, Northlanders. It's Thursday, October 5th. I'm Wyatt Buckner, the Duluth News Tribune Minute, presented by Minnesota Power Employees Credit Union. The average MPECU member saves over $785 a year in better rates and lower fees. And with MPECU, every ATM is your ATM. With their free checking program, you get ATM fee reimbursements at any ATM anywhere in the U.S. Check out Minnesota Power Employees Credit Union services online at mpecu.com or visit their offices in downtown Duluth, Arrowhead Road, or Miller Trunk Highway. Now here's a look at today's headlines. The next bridge that will cross the St. Louis Bay will follow the alignment of the existing Blotnick Bridge. The new bridge substructure, which holds up the girders, would be in a similar arrangement to the existing bridge, and navigational clearances would meet or exceed current clearances, said Pat Houston, major project manager for District 1 with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. The new bridge would have a shared-use path to accommodate pedestrian and bicycle traffic between Duluth and Superior. Houston said the preferred alternative for bridge construction was selected despite a longer anticipated closure because the overall duration of the project is shorter. The choice will also have fewer wetland impacts, require less permanent right-of-way, and has a better cost-benefit ratio and a lower cost estimate. The cost is estimated at $1.72 billion, about $220 million less than the option that would have put the new bridge west of the Blotnick's alignment. Construction of the replacement bridge would result in the relocation of seven businesses at eight locations. Mark Bowker, WizDOT project manager, said officials have had a lot of communication with the business owners through the process so far. Efforts will be made to minimize those impacts and a relocation plan will be developed for each, Houston said. The goal is to start construction in 2026. Funding for the project still hasn't been secured. Minnesota and Wisconsin each authorized funding $400 million for their respective shares of the project, but federal funding hasn't been determined. A group of senators and representatives from both states sent a bipartisan, bicameral letter urging President Joe Biden to support the state's application for federal funding to rebuild the Blotnick Bridge. The almost 8,000-foot bridge over the St. Louis Bay opened to traffic in 1961 and is currently limited to 60% of the capacity of a standard highway bridge, Houston said. In order to comply with new Minnesota art standards, the Duluth School District is considering changing its middle school model. A committee made up of middle school teachers, principals, and other school staff has been working on developing a model since March. The committee presented the Duluth School Board with its model, emphasizing that it is still a work in progress. The district has to implement more fine arts offerings for 7th and 8th grade students to keep up with state standards. The district had initially planned to implement a new middle school schedule this school year to meet the requirements, but asked for a pause from the state to allow staff to be involved with the creation of the new model. The committee is tentatively proposing that instead of six 49-minute periods per day, students would attend four 70-minute periods a day on an A-B schedule. Students would attend periods 1 through 4 on A days and periods 5 through 8 on B days. A benefit of the new model is that it would allow for more course offerings, including exploratory courses for students in grades 6 and 7. The shifted schedule would also allow the fine arts offerings to be slotted into the schedule more easily, though Jen Larva, the district's director of secondary teaching, learning, and equity, said any change to the schedule would result in losses in core class time. The committee is not ready to take the tentative model to the community quite yet, but said that families can expect to see more information in the coming months. Three finalists have been named to serve as the next judge at two North Shore courthouses. Assistant Duluth City Attorney Steve Hankey, Cook County Attorney Molly Hicken, and Grand Marais Practitioner Tyson Smith were recommended by the Minnesota Commission on Judicial Selection. The 6th Judicial District seat is vacant as Judge Michael Cuso retired Monday after nearly 13 years serving as a lone judge in Lake and Cook Counties. Governor Tim Walls is expected to pick a replacement in the coming weeks. He is not bound by the commission's recommendations, but governors typically choose from the panel's list. Hankey handles a variety of civil issues for Duluth, 
along with prosecuting criminal offenses up to gross misdemeanors that occur in city limits. He is also an adjunct professor in the Human Behavior, Justice, and Diversity Department at the University of Wisconsin-Superior. Hicken was first appointed as Cook County's chief prosecutor and legal advisor in 2014 and has subsequently been elected to the post three times. In addition to prosecuting a handful of high-profile homicide cases, she helped establish the county's first treatment court for drug and impaired driving offenses and serves on the advisory council for a local restorative justice program. Smith is managing attorney at Smith Law PLLC in Grand Marais, where as a general practitioner he takes on cases in most major legal areas. He previously was an associate attorney at Minneapolis-based Burnick Lifson PA, handling mostly civil litigation. The 6th district includes 16 judgeships at 6 courthouses across St. Louis, Carleton, Lake, and Cook counties. Both the two North Shore counties having a combined population of roughly just 16,500, one position is split between the two harbors and Grand Marais courthouses. Judges must live within the district and appear on the ballots in all four counties. Now Dan Williamson joins us with a special guest. Thank you very much, Wyatt. I'm joined by one of our colleagues, the great Melinda Levine, Duluth News Tribune features reporter. And Melinda is working on a story we'll be able to see in print on Saturday. It's also a story you can find online prior at DuluthNewsTribune.com. Melinda, this is a story about some gift shop gallery space in downtown Duluth. What more can you tell us? Yeah, so Rabbit, Bird, and Bear Fine Art and Gifts opened up last month. It's right next to Hanabi on downtown Duluth. So you can get your sushi and then walk next door if you want and like look at a plethora of regional artists. There's painters, there's food producers, Leah Yellowbird, Karen Savage Blue, Ashley Highs, so many like amazing artists with regional, indigenous, and diverse backgrounds. This is kind of the brainchild of Michelle LeBeau. She was like the co-executive director of ACO. She retired and with her business partner who is working as the gallery coordinator, Avery makes room for them. They got this gallery space together in like two weeks. Like they just know it was amazing. Like the space used to house women in construction, which Michelle used to manage, but they just have this gorgeous gallery space now. And they have more than 30 different works from different regional artists and food producers. And it's just really something like with their modest square footage, they have packed in a very aesthetically pleasing way. So much creativity that really, you know, represents our area. Very cool. What was your biggest takeaway from the story, Melinda? Oh, my biggest takeaway, I was really just, I'd spoken to Michelle LeBeau before, but I hadn't met her in person. And just being able to spend time with her, she's just like one of those really cool women. Like you can tell, like she doesn't want to be the center of attention. Like she really... I feel like a big value of hers is to build up the people around her. And that's like also reflected in what I heard from people I interviewed who, who are working with her on this space and just very humble, salt of the earth and really knows her stuff. She's just like really, really cool. As far as our audience goes, what do you hope they take away from this story? Um, I hope they take away that you can build stuff in a short amount of time, just like know what you're going to do and go for it. And also with this space that is created, there's going to be more stuff coming. They had a pop-up in Cornucopia this summer, and then there's stuff in the works at Washburn. So I think kind of like keep an eye on this one because there's going to be lots of things to come from this. Melinda, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Dan. And again, you can find Melinda's article in Saturday's print edition of the Duluth News Tribune. You can also find it online prior at DuluthNewsTribune.com. Wyatt, back to you. Thanks, Dan. Now here's a look at your forecast, brought from the News Tribune's Northlandia podcast. Weather for the Duluth area today, looking at chances of showers and windy. High temperatures only in the upper 50s, dropping down into the mid-40s for tonight. We'll still see those shower chances and breezy conditions. Heading into Friday, uh, mostly cloudy skies, showers likely, and high temperatures once again only in the upper 40s. Around 50, but more sunshine for Saturday. I'm Storm Tracker meteorologist Robert Pointer. Thank you to the Northlandia Podcast for their support. The weekly podcast explores curious and unique stories here in the Northland. The latest episode explores how Ashland became the historic mural capital of Wisconsin. You can find new episodes every Tuesday on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you also get this podcast. Reporting for today's episode was done by Shelley Nelson, Terry Caddo, Tom Olson, and Melinda Levine. 
Thank you for listening to the Lewith News Tribune Minute. Have a great day, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.